I mean, we're in an unbelievable moment, right? Right now in the middle in the Middle East, um, it is a moment of revolution where people are asking for um, change, real change, um, particularly in Egypt. Um, and and what's interesting, what's happened in Egypt, at least for this moment in time, um, it's been a real blow to the Al Qaeda narrative. Um, Al Qaeda narrative, remember, is um, that uh, that the nation state system is man-made and therefore fallible. The um, Egyptian government, Homs and Mubarak in particular, is a corrupt apostate actor. And that the only way that you can truly revolutionize society and, um, and uh, attain uh, governance of true Islam in the Al-Qaeda, how they see true Islam, um, the only way you can do that is through violence. And what we've witnessed in this moment is a secular, peaceful protest that, re that removed a dictator from society. So in this moment, uh, Al-Qaeda's narrative has taken a hit, a big hit, because um, change was achieved, revolutionary change was achieved through violence. Mm -hmm. That said, um, we're also in this interesting moment, the post-Mubarak uh, stepping down moment, and um, the leadership structure, the elites in society, particularly the military, is still in place. As a result, I think the litmus test moving forward for um, whether or not Al-Qaeda is able to leverage um, for their own ends uh, the narrative, the negative aspects of the narrative that could come out. Um, the litmus test is whether or not people's lives have changed and uh, uh, people's socioeconomic lives in particular, their freedom um, and their liberty uh, within society. And, um, and if it doesn't, Al-Qaeda will be able to say, see, I told you so. You engage yourself in a a Western, in particular, man-made construct. You've, you're trying to involve yourself in politics and legislating, which is subordinating um, God's law to man's law. And, and you're doing all this stuff. You're, you're following a totally illegitimate path. And you did it through um, peaceful civil disobedience, not violence. And, um, and, and that's why your life hasn't changed, potentially. And so I could, I could see, and I'm speculating, of course, that Al-Qaeda's narrative could uh, shift and it could be really a boon for Al Qaeda's narrative if we don't see real change happening at the most important country in the Middle East, in the bellwether country, which is Egypt in particular. Uh, we, we do that quite often because um, the, uh, the uh, in this case, Al Qaeda uh, movement um, and associated movements are very good at setting traps for us to fall into, and we fall, which we fall into for totally different reasons. Um, the anecdote that comes to mind um, is uh, the attack on Christmas Day last year when uh, Umar Farouk Abdul attempted to uh, uh, blow himself up on a jetliner flying into Detroit. Our response was to ramp up counterterrorism efforts uh, from the area that he um, originated from in terms of his training when this was Yemen with uh, a group called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And then you see there an example where we clearly fall into Al-Qaeda's grievance narrative uh, showing that there they would say there's the United States and the West again propping up, uh, lining the pockets of an apostate regime, in this case President Saleh, a regime that's not governed by true Islam uh, and Al-Qaeda's version of it, uh, a regime that's, um, you know, uh, uh, it's a regime that's totally in the pockets of the United States and the West. And um, as a result, what you need to do if you want to overturn your regime and, and govern and achieve true Islam in Yemen, you can also translate this narrative to Pakistan, Algeria, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, you get the picture. You need to reorient your violence towards the far enemy, the so-called so far enemy, United States and the West, and fight a war of attrition such that the United States says we are no longer going to engage with um, you all in the Middle East, Yemen, Pakistan, these other countries, we have our own problems here, and we're going to, you know, go home and focus on those. And then Al Qaeda would say, then all these regimes will fall: Pakistan will fall, Afghanistan will fall, Iraq will fall, so on and so forth. And then maybe we'll be able to reestablish this caliphate. This is a cosmic kind of worldview, a grand strategy, but this is how Al Qaeda is trying to achieve its ends. In the domestic context, we have civil liberties. I mean, this is the most important and, uh, difference, and um, and it's great. And 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 our f the freedom in our society is something to be obviously cherished. But it does make it difficult in finding the next, the would-be uh, Nadil Hassan's, the would-be Faisal Shahzads, the would-be Najibul Azazis, would-be Brian Neil Venuses, um, all these individuals, American uh, citizens who attempted to conduct attacks or did execute attacks 
here in the domestic homeland. So the federal, the FBI is constantly, um, uh, you know, they're they're constantly trying to figure out how do we find the next Najib Bolzazi, um, and um, and they're trying to find people who are who find resonance in the Al Qaeda grievance narrative. And um, it is a difficult is a difficult question that the United States is, and the and this lead CT agency, counterterrorism agency, FBI, is struggling with. Um, they've had some successes. They've taken down and they've been able to foil many plots by um, basically befriending these people and, and allowing them to take their mens reis or their idea for um, murder, frankly, to action, to actus reis. And they've been able to help that process along to demonstrate their intent to move toward action, but that's only going to work for so long. It's, it's very difficult to figure out a person who uh, is moving on that path towards what we would say towards radicalization. Um, but, you know, it's really change over time. You have to look at a person where they're at in a particular point in time and try to see where their trajectory is. It's a, it's a very great business and it's not something easily done in the domestic realm. In the international realm, we have uh, more wide-ranging um, uh, um, uh, tools, so to speak, um, that allows us to uh, listen to people and, and, and such, and uh, which which is not as um, restrictive um, in the international realm. The most essential elements of leadership are actually transcendent, and um, although different things receive primacy in different moments in time, so the leaders that I most appreciated and I, um, you know, looked up to and that I try to model my own leadership after uh, kind of had two particular aspects of their leadership dynamic. One is uh, a service-driven leadership, a leadership that is, leadership is fundamentally selfless. Uh, it's something that we don't see in society in many different sectors today. The concept that leadership is not about the leader, it's about serving everybody else who you have the privilege to lead for a moment in time and that you're a caretaker for an institution and entity in a, in a particular moment in time. Say the second aspect is character, and again, something else I think we would all agree that um, uh, w might be lacking in, in in this moment in time. But I think we've seen it in other time periods in in history, or or even in recent history, or in leaders that we have today. So I would say those are the two things that we need. Uh, I would say in this particular moment in time, what's going to take primacy from um, how a leader sees his or herself in that moment it, in a particular moment is that they have to become increasingly comfortable with um, ambiguity, uncertainty, and risk um, because of the fluid nature of the environment. And so I think many times uh, the best leaders, particularly who are running uh, complex organizations that operate at the tactical, operational, strategic level, instead of leading from the front, that's cliche, someone should always lead from the front and, and, and share hardship with the people that you're leading, but leading from the center and be able to look left, right, forward, and backward, and all around yourself, and be able to take good stock and a good survey of what's happening in any moment in time and seeing how it all fits together. I was uh, in Iraq uh, for a combat tour in, in 2004. I was in Samarra, Iraq, and we had a, uh, a dramatic uh, mass casualty event that happened on, on my unit in Samarra. And, um, and as a result of that event, for a number of different reasons, uh, much of the senior leadership in my battalion ended up getting fired. And it was interesting, it was a very interesting moment because the soldiers w and of course officers were going out every single day, risking their lives, but we all thought we were on the best team. And then fundamentally your senior leadership have, has come in and said, no, your senior leaders in your battalion, you, you weren't the best team. In fact, you might've been the worst team. How do you get the soldier to go out the, the gate again to continue what they're doing when all the senior leaders have just been fired, not tomorrow, but in the next, but five minutes from now, when they've just found out that all their leaders have been fired, but we've got to continue mission. Um, what I took from that particular moment as a junior leader, and what I learned, frankly, from my peer leaders in that moment, as well as, is just the tremendous importance of sharing hardship. Um, the soldiers at the end of the day knew that the junior leaders in the battalion, who were still there, who hadn't been fired, so to speak, who were still in the, in, in the battalion and will be there, were there at the beginning, shared the hardship and the rigors of combat with them, and will be there all the way at the end. And that's what keeps people going. It's almost like a, it's almost, a leader can be very effective if they can, um, if the um, individual who they're leading 
shares, uh, it feels like they're, the proximity is very close. And this is the real challenge for a strategic leader. How do you make someone feel like you're approximate to them, that you have approximate connection to them? Now, you don't want, of course, like have a general <laughs> directing a private on the ground, but you want them to be able to feel proximate to you and be able to nest their their actions within the intent that you see for the organization. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite a, it's actually, I think it's quite a delicate and very um, uh, nuanced stance that you have to do as a strategic leader. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, but in that moment, I really understood the importance of being proximate to the soldiers and really sharing in the hardships. Because the only reason why we ended up going out of the gate five minutes after, so to speak, I'm, you know, um, five minutes after we found out our senior leadership has been fired, is again, because they knew that we were going to share the hardship with them. I had a very unique set of experiences and I really got to test my leadership, fail and succeed, which, was a, which is an incredible opportunity at a very young age with lar relatively large organizations, uh, as many as uh, 300 people we had in our company in Iraq at that time. But it's very insular. Uh, the military, uh, the, the dynamic and the style of leadership is narrow and, and, and it has transcending principles but it's very narrow to the culture of the military. What was really neat about coming to the Kennedy School is circulating with people from all walks of life, right, and different kinds of backgrounds, and, and learning from their perspective of how to lead different kinds of organizations and how to position yourself in the organization and, and such, and uh, civilian agencies or international agencies. I'd say second is uh, valuing the analytical aspects of leadership. The human dimension of leadership is what you get very um, up close and personal and intensely in the military. You learn how to what makes people tick and how to get them to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, but I think sometimes in the military, at least at the junior officer level, which is where I was at, um, sometimes the analytical aspects of leadership, um, understanding, um, you know, basically doing statistics and stuff and understanding how to allocate scarce resources is not is undervalued, I think, in a lot of ways. And I think here at the Kennedy School, I, I gained a pr greater appreciation. And, I, and, and in fact, I can see how that transcends very quickly to being a strategic leader because um, you're allocating resources, I think, all the time. We're an interesting leadership moment. I mean, there are glimmers of great leaders, greatness, really. And I think there's a whole lot of um, uh, leaders out there that um, don't live up to that uh, standard of the privilege to lead other people. And um, so I think moving forward, I think the challenge is that for strategic leaders in particular, while I've never been a strategic leader, if I could just be one person who's observed, you know, just observing it from afar, um, I would say that I think moving forward, Leaders who are going to be successful in the 21st century, if you will, are going to be those who are able to build um, sustainable organizations, organizations that are going to be here for the long run. I think particularly in the corporate sector, I would even suggest in the government that we have leaders who are consumed by the immediate and don't have the opportunity or don't take the initiative to pick their head up and look um, towards the long run. So sustainable um, organizations, I think, is going to be a real challenge. I, the other thing I mentioned already, but... Um, Leaders who um, are able to operate with even more uh, fluidity and, and uncertainty and ambiguity than has ever been before. And then their comfort with risk and be able to metric risk versus reward in a very sophisticated and nuanced way so they understand how to apply their resources um, appropriately. Um, I think those are some of the things, that the challenges that strategic leaders in particular are going to have moving forward.